Greetings, my friend. Welcome to the podcast, Teaching That Transforms, with Pastor Jimmy Knott. Thanks so much for joining me today. Well, we continue our season of a subject that's so critically important, don't be deceived from Scripture. Such an important thing for us. Deception is so real, and we're all very susceptible. Satan is a liar and a deceiver and the best at both. Paul warned us that as we move toward the end times that more and more deception would take place. So without a doubt, being deceived is a real and a very present danger. Specifically, Scripture warns us of a few areas where we need to be particularly careful not to be led astray and to be deceived. Last episode, we looked at one that Jesus gives us concerning the most important area of all, our own personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Jesus warns us not to be deceived about the genuineness of our salvation. Our next one, we make our way to the book of James in James chapter 1. In James chapter 1 in verses 16 through 18, James writes, Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be kind of first fruits of his creatures. Don't be deceived about the goodness of God. That's what James is saying. Every good and perfect gift. Just two or three quick things that just jump out in those few verses. Uh, number one, the Father gives good. The Father is good and He gives good. In fact, He gives perfect. Next, it's coming down. It really means it is continually coming down from God. Next, we see with whom there's no variation or shadow due to change. His goodness doesn't change. It's always completely and perfectly good, and it is always the same. And then one of the ultimate expressions of His goodness is in that He brought us forth by the word of truth. In other words, he brought us into a saving relationship with himself through his son. So God is good no matter what. And no matter what, God is good. He's always good. And he's always out for our good, even when we can't see it and circumstances seem to say otherwise. This is a vital truth to believe. Up front, let me recommend to you uh, I do this now and again, a couple of really good resources on this really, really important uh, subject. One is by Randy Alcorn, Randy Alcorn, an exhaustive book, but it, really an easy read. It's just a long read entitled, If God is Good, and then a book uh, written by Larry Crabb, a Christian uh, psychiatrist and counselor, entitled Finding God. Both of those are available on Amazon, and I encourage that you uh, uh, get one or both of those and read them. But today, don't be deceived about the goodness of God. And I'm going to go over five truths about the goodness of God. But let me say this up front, which is so truly important. We truly find God when we're able to fully trust His goodness. Until we truly believe that God is completely good, we will not, in fact, we cannot, fully trust Him with our lives. So let's look at the goodness of God. First, God is good in His nature and in His actions. God is good in His nature and in His actions. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 34, 8, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the person who takes refuge in Him. Taste and see, experience that the Lord is completely good. Experience that on, on your own. Psalm 119, 68, the psalmist writes, You are good and you do good. God is good in who he is. God is good in his nature. God is good in his character. There is simply no flaw in the goodness of God. And he's also good in all that he does. His actions, his conduct is always good. The psalmist said in Psalm 100, verse 5, The Lord is good. And that's so consistent with so many, many scriptures in Psalm 25, 8, good and upright is the Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. Jeremiah, God told him, 
God, call unto me and I will answer you and I will tell you great, good, and hidden things that you have not known. Prophet Nahum, chapter 1, verse 7, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. Holding on to that goodness in the day of trouble is so vital. He knows those who take refuge in him. And then one, where Jesus boldly proclaimed that God is good. And Jesus said to him, this would be to the rich young ruler that's found in uh, Matthew chapter 19 and Mark 8. And Jesus told him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. There are over 50 references, many in the book of Psalms, that declare God is good and who he is and what he does. And even his goodness is described in Scripture. The Bible describes his goodness as great in Nehemiah 9, as rich in Psalm 104, as abundant, Psalm 31, as satisfying, Psalm 64, as universal, going out to all, the righteous, the unrighteous, the good, even the evil. God is good to all, and it's enduring, and it is eternal. God is good in his, who he is and what he does. Now, to declare that God is good in all he is and all he does is not to say that God will always appear to be good, especially in difficult, painful, tragic, dark circumstances. But our view of God and his complete goodness, our, it, it, it's so limited and it's so distorted because of our own uh, falls, fallenness. And what we want to do is we want to take our standards, especially our standard for what's good to us and for us, and we want to impose those on God and even on others. You see, we all tend we all tend to, to judge God and others by our own standards, especially in terms of what's good for us. So let me ask you, you own a dog. Let's just use a dog. Imagine your dog saying, if I were my master, I'd never discipline me or give me a shot or give me a big pill. I'd let me run free in the neighborhood and, and steal food off of barbecues that I find. But since he doesn't do this, then he must not be good. Now, the master would never, would never determine his actions by the skewed view of what's good to his dog. Applying human standards to God is like dogs applying dog standards to us. And our conclusions will invariably and always come up short. Imagine, I mean, a teenager, what teenager hasn't thought? Well, if my parents were really good, they'd let me do what I wanted to do, when I wanted to do it, where I wanted to do it, how I wanted to do it, who I wanted to do it with. They'd let me stay up all night. They'd let me live on social, social media. They'd let me eat what I wanted to eat. They'd let me hang around, date, what is it were, whoever I want to eat, marry whoever I wanted to marry. Well, what good parent would do that? Well, none, because it's not good for the child and for the teenager. God is good in who he is and what he does. And we have to be careful that we don't define goodness as what we feel like is good for us. We have to leave that to God. A second truth, which is such an important truth, is doubting, doubting God's goodness. Doubting God's goodness leads to sin. Doubting God's goodness always leads to sin, without exception. Over and again, you keep returning to the scene of the crime when all of this started in the Garden of Eden with Eve and then Adam. God had put them in a not just a good environment, but a perfect environment. Gave them In his goodness, he gave them absolute freedom except for one tree in the midst of a perfect environment that he had created. And yet, when Satan came along in Genesis chapter 3, he never questioned that God was good in all the other things that he made accessible and available to Eve, but he caused her to doubt God's goodness in one area, which caused her to doubt that God was completely good, completely good. And see, and that's our issue at times. If I were to ask you, especially if you claim to be a Christ follower, do you believe that God is good? You wouldn't hesitate. You'd say, absolutely, God is good. But if I were to ask you, do you believe that God is completely, perfectly good? 
completely perfectly good. There could be a, a scintilla of doubt. Maybe you believe that God is good, but not always or completely. Maybe 99.9% .9 you believe that. But that shortfall is where you and I get into trouble because we begin to take matters, as it were, into our own hands, which is always, always dangerous. Larry Crabb, and I mentioned his uh, excellent book on finding God, he writes, and I'm just taking this from uh, several pages, uh, not just one particular area, but it's a wonderful book. I encourage you to get it. From birth, we are all doubters. Questioning God's goodness could be the foundation of our, of our fallenness. Our inclination to sin is rooted in the suspicion that God is not perfectly good. That doubt causes us to take personal responsibility for our own comfort and well-being. Sin is often our effort to supplement what we think are shortfalls in God's goodness. Start to trust self rather than God for our needs. This is further confirmed when bad things happen, even more so if God appears silent during those times. Such times cause me to doubt his goodness, not fully trust him, and drag my feet to obey his will. We must allow nothing to shake our belief in God's absolute goodness. Nothing. God is good no matter what. Don't ever doubt that. Eve doubted. Eve doubted. She almost completely trusted, but she doubted in that one area where Satan deceived her. Eve doubted that God was good completely. And then Adam came along, and he wasn't even deceived. And he ate some as well. See, Eve doubted that God was completely good. Adam doubted, frankly, that God was good enough to atone for their failure, to give them freedom, mercy, grace, and forgiveness as a result of their failure. Doubting God's goodness, I'm telling you, eventually open the door and lead us into personal sin. Third truth, evil and suffering, which are very real. I don't have to tell you that. Evil and suffering never contradict God's goodness. Never contradict His goodness. Never true. In fact, the psalmist said in Psalm 119, verse 71, It is good, it is good for me that I was afflicted that I might learn thy statutes. The psalmist had learned in this world that Times of affliction are great opportunities for us to grow, to grow and to mature. And that circumstances never violate that God is completely good. You see, again, going back to the garden, natural evil is the result of a fallen and a cursed world. And that's why we have such difficult things in our, in our fallen, cursed uh, earth as uh, hurricanes and tornadoes and forest fires and etc., because when Adam and Eve failed to fulfill their God-given authority and responsibility to rule over the earth, God gave that to the enemy, Satan. So he's going to do everything that he possibly can to, to, uh, to muck it up. So natural evil, we live in a fallen world that affects uh, everything in it. And then there's the moral evil, which is really human evil. That's the result of our own sin natures that we got from Adam that results in bad choices. One of the biggest questions for many unbeliever skeptics and even those seeking, and I think also a struggle for many Christians, is the age-old question, if God is good and powerful, then why is there evil and suffering? Well, it's a great question, but we have to ask, in light of what we know about creation and the fall and the entrance of sin, who's responsible for sin and therefore for evil and suffering? Was it God or was it people? Well, it was people. You see, if God were to intervene into our course of affairs and choose to eliminate evil and suffering in this life, he would have to destroy our freedom. And frankly, he'd have to destroy us. God does have an ultimate solution, if not immediate and our personal relationship with Christ. Because in the meantime, in the meantime, Paul said, all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. 
and that we are predestined to be conformed to the image of God. God can, will, and does use evil and suffering, our own sinfulness, to achieve a greater purpose in conforming us as his children to become more like Christ in our lives. Evil and suffering never contradicts God's complete and perfect goodness, no matter what. Like our pet, like our teenagers, we see good in what makes us comfortable and, and, and healthy and maybe happy. God sees it in terms of what makes us more like Jesus. And besides, I mean really besides, where does God ever promise in this life that being good or godly will enable us to avoid suffering? In fact, Jesus said to the contrary, in this world, in this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. <clears throat> Fourth truth, God's goodness, God's goodness is intended to transform our lives, to change us again and conform us into the image of Christ, which is so important. The cross of Christ which in one way was the ultimate tragedy of human existence, but at the same time became the supreme expression of God's perfect goodness because it's through the cross and the glorious resurrection of Jesus that you and I find forgiveness of sin and salvation. And his goodness to us in this life is shown in at least two specific ways. One I read earlier in James 1.17, that God only gives good gifts. Every good and every perfect gift comes down from God. All that we have is a result of the goodness of God. And a second way he shows his goodness is that his will is good. He said, I know the plans I have for you in Jeremiah 29, plans for good and not for evil, plans to give you a future and a hope. God has specific plans for each one of us that are good. And then Romans chapter 12, Paul's warned us, don't be conformed to this world. Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold, but be transformed. Be transformed by renewing your mind and your heart, focusing on God and discerning what the will of God is, which is good, acceptable, and perfect. God has a plan for every one of us. And it's not just good, he said it's perfect. You can't improve on it. All expressions of the goodness of God. So how then should we respond? Well, Paul wrote in Romans chapter 2 in verses 4 and 5, Or do you presume upon the riches of his goodness and forbearance and patience? Do you not know that God's goodness is intended to lead you to repentance? God's goodness is intended to lead us to trust his character and to trust him no matter what. So how should we respond to those little scintillas, those gaps, as it were, doubts that God is completely good? Well, we should repent and conform so we can be transformed in our lives. And then a final truth, the goodness of God in this life, the goodness of God in this life is but a sampling of the goodness of God in the life to come in heaven, in the heaven. In Revelation 21, verses 3 and 4, I read these words. And I heard a great voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling of God is with men. Now the old earth has passed away, and the new earth, which is the new heaven, we are back, but we are back to the eternal perfect state that God created originally in the Garden of Eden. And he shall live with his people, just like he visited Adam and Eve there in the Garden and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. One day, no more evil. One day, no more suffering. One day, no more sin. One day, no more Satan. One day, no more evil suffering. All gone. One day, because of Jesus, God's ultimate solution will reverse the curse both the natural evil and the moral evil. We'll reverse that and shower his perfect goodness on us for all eternity. So hold on, my friend. Trust in his goodness no matter what. Trust in his goodness. 
as I said earlier, we truly find God when we are able to fully trust His goodness. Sinclair Ferguson, years ago, wrote a book entitled Deserted by God. In that book, he tells the story of an English missionary named Alan Gardiner. In January of 1852, a search party found Gardiner's lifeless body. He and his companions had shipwrecked on Tierra del Fuego, which is an island off the uh, south coast of Argentina. Their provisions had run out, and they had starved to death. A missionary doing God's work. Gardner at one point felt so desperate for water, his pangs of thirst, he wrote in his journal, almost intolerable were his thirst. Far from home, far from his loved ones, he and those others died alone, isolated, weak, and physically broken. Yet, Despite the wretched conditions of his death, Gardiner wrote out scripture passages, including Psalm 34.10, the young lions, the strong, they're even not totally independent. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall want no good thing, shall not want any good thing. Excuse me. Near death, handwriting feeble, Gardiner Gardiner managed to write one final entry in his journal. Here are those words. I am overwhelmed with a sense of the goodness of God. Wow. Wow. How could you have such a perspective? How could you draw such a conclusion? You believe God is good no matter what. Again, as I said earlier, until we truly believe God is good, we will not, in fact, I think cannot, fully trust Him with our lives. One verse to close, my friend. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the person who takes refuge in Him. Experience His goodness, my friend. Move to that final one-tenth of a percent. Move to that fire. Trust Him even when things are dark and desperate, even dangerous or evil or suffering. Trust Him no matter what. Don't let your standards of what you think the Master should do for you that's in turn good. And trust the God who is perfect in who He is and what He does, especially toward us. Thank you for listening, my friend, to Teaching That Transforms with Pastor Jimmy Knott. Remember, it only transforms us when we apply it. Blessings from Pastor Jimmy. I'll see you next time.